Okay, so the chloride anomaly is the theme. There are many anomalies, times where the table doesn't make the right prediction. Taking a little step back, thinking of where does this table come from, the numbers all come from voltaic cell experiments. The zero again isn't really zero, we just picked it. Okay. And I'm using the word we, but it's scientific bodies pick, that's the zero. If you take the hydrogen uh, half reaction, you pair it up with fluorine, you get 2.87 volts. Okay. So all of these came from reactions of hydrogen, and that's where the order came from. Okay. There are a few cases where this order doesn't predict reactions with different combinations. And this is one of them. Okay. When you have the only reducing agents as chloride and water, okay, the actual reaction that we see experimentally is the chlorine half reaction acting as the strongest reducing agent. And you need to be able to identify this anomaly on tests or quizzes. If you look at your table, before I taught this anomaly, the strongest reducing agent would be the lowest one down, and you would have told me, oh, water is the lowest reducing agent, so that would be the best. Okay? But we don't see water reacting, we see chloride reacting. Okay? So when I, in my notes, when I say the chlorine half reaction, I'm referring to the chlorine chloride. So anytime you see chlorine and water as your RAs, you need to write chloride as the strongest RA, the one that's going to react at the anode, not water. Okay. And that's kind of all there is. You just have to be able to identify it. Now, I've taken a shot of the data table. I don't want you to write this all down, but I certainly want it in my notes. I'm just going to repeat what I highlighted on the board, on my table, sorry. Those are the three um, reducing agents that we would have when we just have chlorine and water. Okay. The lower we get, the stronger the reducing agent, okay. but it's the chloride half reaction is the one we see, is the anomaly. Okay. We do not see water reacting. Okay. Uh, we pretty We put this once in a test most of the time. Okay. If you were writing the diploma, you'd see this sort of once on the diploma for sure. Don't go looking for this all the time. Okay. But again, it's something you need to be able to identify if it is there one time. Okay. So that's the first slide I wanted to do. I'm wrapping up electrolytic cells. This is going to end the cell lesson at the end of this lesson. And all we have left is cell stoichiometry to do next. Cell stoic is very math-based. It's if we know how long we run a cell. So in the potassium iodide lab, you connected the battery for about 20 seconds. If you measured that exact time and you measured how much current flowed, you could predict you know, what mass of hydrogen bubbles came off one of the electrodes. Okay? And that's the lesson left for tomorrow. Okay. So I've got two slides left on electrolytic cells. I've got another example, and then I've got electroplating. Um, so one really common process that's done, a commercial process of electrolytic cells, is the chloral alkyl process. And this is done for financial engineering needs. You can make products that you can sell into the marketplace, and there's lots of industrial uh, need. If you take aqueous sodium chloride, sometimes just called brine or salt brine, you can make chlorine, you can make hydrogen, and you can make sodium hydroxide. If you think of, well, chlorine, all those bleach products, particularly during COVID, you can't make enough bleach or sanitizing products fast enough. Hospitals, lots of people need them. So that's where chlorine has value, uh, largely in, in bleach and disinfectants. Hydrogen can be used as a fuel, 
and sodium hydroxide is a very common base used in industry. That's the number one base we use at Notre Dame High School. Every high school lab in the city is buying lots of sodium hydroxide for labs, Science 10, Chem 20, Chem 30. You can make this from sodium chloride brine. Any thoughts on where you might get a sodium chloride solution really cheaply? Did you say Canada? What part of Canada? You can get it at certain parts. Alberta wouldn't be a very good place. So where could you get a sodium chloride solution? Probably pretty cheaply. Sarah? Yeah, why the east or west coast? You're right. Yeah, salt water, ocean. Okay. So if you pump ocean water into your factory, your processing plant, you're going to have to use energy because we're going to see this is electrolytic, and you can get those products and then uh, send them off to customers. So aqueous sodium chloride brine, just salt water would work. Okay, so that's going to be a pretty cheap reactant. Uh, this is uh, the, the stoichiometric uh, ratios that we see. Uh, you need two sodium chloride. Uh, you need two water molecules. You get your chlorine, which actually comes out at the anode, and you get hydrogen gas and sodium hydroxide coming out at the cathode. Okay. This should look a little bit like the lab you did. You got bubbles and, and a base at one of the electrodes okay, at the cathode in your lab. Now I'm asking you, can you figure out the two half reactions for me? Okay. What's the uh, strongest OA, the reduction half reaction? What's the strongest RA? What's the oxidation half reaction? You do have a spectator ion in this reaction. So when you predict these uh, two half reactions for me, something's going to disappear, the spectator. So we'll just pause for a moment and give you a chance to try to digest those two reactants and try to figure out the half reactions. You'll know you found the right ones if you get the right products. Okay. So when you go to find your winners, the oxidizing agents, there's nothing new here. You compare sodium to water and water is slightly higher up. Neither are very good OAs, but water wins by a little bit. 2H2O liquid plus two electrons makes one hydrogen gas molecule and two hydroxides. And that matches what we would expect at the cathode. For the strongest reducing agent, we have chlorine, water, and sorry, chloride, chloride and water, and just water. So we have these three red boxed ones. That's the chloride anomaly. Okay. If you go too quick and you list those three, you'd think water would be the strongest RA. Okay. But we have that, but we just talked about uh, chloride actually is what we see. So we have to grab the two chloride ion half reaction produces chlorine plus two electrons. So what I did, I just gave an example of what the chlorine anomaly would look like uh, on a test or quiz. Okay? But you wouldn't have the answers here. I could give you aqueous sodium chloride brine is an electrolytic cell. What's the product? And you have to be able to identify it. If you have another RA, the chlor chlorine anomaly is out. As long as it's better. If I put in solid gold, it wouldn't wreck the chlorine anomaly. It would still happen. But if I threw in mercury or bromide, then bromide's going to be the winner. Okay. So if you see chlorine in a, in a reaction, your brain has to go, oh, I better check to make sure it's not the exception. Last thing for today is electroplating. So 
So uh, I'm not going to do this with words, but we're going to deconstruct what's going on in this electrolytic cell. Okay. I'd write this fairly big because I'm going to write a lot of uh, information in this. What's, what's getting smaller? What's move, moving? What's the anode? What's the cathode? We have a silver electrode. We have silver ions in solution with some arrows. We'll talk about that arrow motion later. We've got a battery. We've got electron flow and it's labeled. The direction is noted. And we have a spoon. A spoon is acting as one of our electrodes. There's a reason for that. And we've got silver nitrate in solution. It's way at the bottom of the beaker. It might be hard to notice. AgNO3 aqueous. Leave the title up for another 20 seconds, and I'm going to hide the title. So I'm going to start writing out the two half reactions that occur. I'm not going to do all the steps and prove it. So I'm skipping uh, the predicting part. Okay. The strongest OA, which I'm going to put dash C as a reminder, that's going to occur at the cathode, uh, is going to be silver ion. So AG plus aqueous is going to gain an electron and make solid silver. Again, that's going to happen at the cathode. The strongest reducing agent, I'm going to put a little dash A to remind me that's going to happen at the anode. That ends up being solid silver. It's going to make silver plus and spit out an electron. If I look at the E naught cell, it's the same half reaction in both cases. I'm going to get 0, 0.00 volts. The minimum voltage to run this is going to be positive 0, 0.00 volts. I need some voltage slightly above zero to run this electrolytic cell to take one type to take silver ions and turn them into solid silver. If I do a little bit of labeling, how I set up the battery is going to determine where the solid silver is made. I want, the whole point of electroplating is to make a solid on top of something. We want the spoon to be electroplated. That may not be obvious before now, but the whole point of electroplating is to cover something in a metal. Okay? So we need the spoon covered. We need solid silver to form here. Okay? What electrode has solid silver formed at it? Uh, that's the cathode. We must have the spoon be the cathode. Okay. 
we don't want to make the silver over here. We want to make the solid silver. Make means product. What polarity is the cathode in a electrolytic cell? Is it positive? No, that would be a voltaic cell, would be positive. A electrolytic cell has the cathode as negative. So this has to be the negative terminal of our battery, pushing electrons to the cathode. Okay. This big chunk of silver is our anode, which is positive. And everything on this side is positive. Okay. Our electron flow is always anode to cathode. And we've got the electron flow is going anode to cathode. In this case, when you have a battery, the electrons are now coming out of the battery and being sucked into the battery, okay. where before they were freely coming out of the anode, now it's really the battery driving it. When we've set up our electroplating with the cathode as what we want to get plated, the cell runs as expected. Okay. You, you need your battery. It's going to cost you money to either use up a battery or put a power supply. You have to pay Nmax for those electrons. Okay. But other than that electricity bill, uh, you can easily plate something. I guess you're going to have to pay for this silver also. Okay. Uh, so this is how you could put a thin layer of silver on top of a spoon and electroplate. Okay. And again, uh, many things, most things are electroplated today. We kind of live in a world where we want things really cheap, but we want it to look nice. If you want something cheap, but to look nice, you probably make it plastic or cheap underneath and you put something really nice on top. Okay. I would almost guarantee these stool legs are probably electroplated. It's probably some cheap metal underneath and they just coat it in whatever this is. What is this? Chrome maybe. Okay. And that's how you can make something that looks nice but is inexpensive. Okay, don't do this at home. But if you take your kitchen taps at home, you know, 40, 50 years ago they'd be all solid metal. Today they're probably plastic underneath with chrome or nickel plated on top. Cheaper plastic underneath, nice shiny pretty metal on top. You go to Home Depot and you ooh and ah, oh, it looks really nice, but it's cheap. Okay. Again, if you took a knife and scraped it, you'd probably scrape off the chrome and see the plastic underneath, but your parents will will kill you. Like, they'll make you pay 200 bucks to buy new tops and be very upset. Okay? You, everything around us is electroplated. Most things around us are plastic okay, with some metal on top. Okay? I'm not going to look all around this room, but you look almost everywhere that you see a metal, it's probably just plated on top. Okay? Now, you have to be smart and set it up right. If you are not a good chemistry student or you're a really bad engineer and you put the battery in backwards, you now make the cathode on the left and you make your spoon the anode and you start reacting away your spoon and plating your spoon over here, which would get you fired really quickly. You've just destroyed somebody's precious heirloom. So it's really important you set this cell up the right way. You get to force something to be the cathode. How do you force it to be the cathode? You connect the battery up properly. Okay? And it forces it to be uh, the cathode. Okay? So that is uh, electroplating. Okay? And that wraps up electrolytic cells. There's nothing special about electrolytic cells sorry, electroplating different than any other electrolytic cell. It just always plays a metal. Um, this section, your book does a good job of going through a lot of examples. You don't have to memorize all those examples, uh, but they tend to show up on diplomas if you write them, or when we go to make up test questions, they sometimes come from the science uh, that's described in the book. So it's good if you have time. It's not a must to read, but it's a good to read. Okay. And then on page 651, you have a bunch more electrolytic cell problems to work on. Okay. Again, the only thing left is cell stoichiometry.